So why is everyone so excited about React Native? Well, here's the elevator pitch. Compared to web development, mobile application development really kind of sucks. And if mobile development were just more similar to web development, in a couple of key areas, things would be significantly better. And you know, there was never really a good way to do this until Facebook came and saved everyone last year and released React Native, which is a framework that makes building mobile apps much more similar to the workflows we already use on the web. And it's really exciting because it's going to make the process of building mobile apps in order of magnitude simpler and more approachable for almost every developer. So what specifically am I talking about here? Why is building mobile apps so much worse than web development right now? First and foremost is the issue of device fragmentation, the eternal holy war between iOS and Android. Right now, the Android operating system has around 82% global usage, but that number is much closer to 50-50 in the United States. And if you look at the total sales generated from each platform's respective app store, iOS generates significantly more revenue than Android does, despite only having 12% of the total smartphones in the world. So given this fact pattern, as a developer, if you're going to build a mobile application, which platform do you target? Do you build an iOS where you can potentially make more money, but you have an app that doesn't work on eight out of every 10 phones in the world? Or do you build an Android, but miss out on the opportunity to make more money from it? I mean, it's really crazy that you even have to ask this question. Could you imagine if you're building a website and you had to ask whether or not you should build for Firefox or for Chrome? No, you just build a web application and it runs everywhere. You don't really care what browser the user has. So it turns out this is a trick question. The answer is, if you're serious about making a mobile application, you need to build on both platforms. But it's so expensive and time consuming to do this right now. Just doing some quick back of the napkin math, at least, you know, in Silicon Valley, you need to pay an iOS developer at least $100,000, an Android developer is around $100,000, plus, you know, you need the coordination overhead for managing two separate builds and projects. So, I mean, if you want 18 months of revenue, of runway rather, uh, I, I don't see how you could possibly do that without at least half a million dollars. And you know who has half a million dollars lying around? You basically need venture capital to build anything of significance on mobile, and that sucks. You want to just be able to test things out, um, not have to raise money just to test out a new business model. So, I, I mean, we definitely want this to be more like the web. Another issue with mobile development are the programming languages. Most iOS apps are written in Swift and Objective-C, whereas Android apps are written in Java and XML. And the thing that makes programming languages different from one another are what they choose to emphasize. And none of these languages are designed for developer productivity. I mean, Craig Federini can stand up at WWDC and talk about how great Swift is all he wants, but at the end of the day, it's not a language designed to make you productive. It's optimized for performance, maybe, or reliability, maybe, but definitely not productivity, which is a problem when you're trying to be productive as a developer. Look at this actual Swift code to make an API request and parse the JSON response. Like this is actual code from a Swift tutorial online. Look at what you have to do. I mean, you create this session object and then you call data task with request and you have to type cast the result and return value as void. And then you need to wrap the whole thing in an if else for if there's an error. Uh, and then when you're in that block on the bottom, you have to get the result and try uh, ns json serialization dot json object with data to parse the json string but don't forget the dot allow fragments option and you have to typecast that as a dictionary of type string any object and, and then if you wanted to access a key in in that payload you you know you'd have to typecast that as an array of dictionary string any object but that whole thing needs to be wrapped in a try catch block because the json parsing could error and, and, you know, forget if you actually wanted to parse um, a JSON payload into a domain object or a model object, because your model objects, you know, every attribute has to be typed. So you need to typecast every single attribute in the payload. And if it's nested, that's a whole nother thing, because you need to typecast it as a nested object. And I mean, it's just an utter disaster. And, and compare this, you know, to what you do in JavaScript. You'd get an object and call response.json, which takes the JSON string and turns it into a JavaScript object, and that's it. I, I mean, like, it's much simpler code throughout your entire code base. It's just an order of magnitude productivity gain to be writing JavaScript over Swift for some things. And 
What's happening now is that JavaScript is increasingly becoming a compile target for programming languages. So you can write code in any programming language that you want and compile that into JavaScript. And now that language runs anywhere JavaScript runs. There's a couple popular projects already on iOS for ClojureScript, which lets you write Clojure code compile that into JavaScript and then run that in React Native. So, I mean, the programming language parity on the web is definitely something that we want. So we're not stuck in these really unproductive workflows. And speaking of unproductive workflows, most iOS apps are written in Xcode and most Android apps are written in Android Studio. And these IDEs aren't really great for productivity either. I mean, whenever you want to test your app in development, you have to build the app which is compile the source code into an executable file. And this can take a really long time on larger code bases. And it's also really prone to like crashing. I mean, Xcode crashes all the time, which is a problem because when you reboot it, it needs to re-index your entire project. And this whole process constantly can take you out of flow when you're trying to be productive. You also get these weird derived data folders that constantly pop up that have partial builds in them. So something that you know was working a second ago will stop working because some state somewhere is just out of sync. And you'll need to go track it down and delete it. And all of these tasks just take you out of the process of building your application. Um, and you know on the web, we have these great live reloaded workflows that just don't exist on mobile. Another problem with mobile development are the distribution platforms. Now the web has this down perfectly. You just upload code to a server, the user goes to a website, and they download the latest version of your code every time they visit. But on mobile, they have the code saved locally on their phone. So how do they initially get it? Well, they get it from these app marketplaces like the iOS App Store and Google Play for Android. But these marketplaces, especially the iOS App Store, are fucking terrible. First off, they have these arbitrary stop gates that prevent you from deploying your code. So say I fix a bug for an app I have, I submit that fix to the App Store. Apple will literally put it in a fucking queue for seven days while they sit there and count their money, and then they will maybe let it through. If you want to submit your app for the first time, it might take a month to get into the App Store because they might reject it for weird terms of service violations or for not having a privacy policy. And I mean, when you can't even update your code whenever you want to, I mean, just it's just a disaster to maintain. You have also have this issue of version management. User A might be on version 1.1 of your app. User B might be on version 1.2. User C might be on version 1.3. And you need to manage all these different versions. You can't assume that a user is going to be updated to the latest version. And you can't force an update on them. So you have to manage multiple versions at the same time constantly. Also, you know, whatever, whatever your thoughts on Apple are, you have to admit the dictatorship is real. Uh, take the example of Flux, which was this awesome app that dimmed the background light of your iPhone in weird colors that Apple wouldn't let you do normally. And it was a really popular app on your iPhone until Apple said, hey, this would be awesome to implement ourselves in iOS, and they just straight ghosted them. They kicked them out of the App Store, said you're violating the terms of service, implemented the feature themselves into iOS, and took it from there. So, so you're kind of always at their mercy whenever you're deploying on their platform. But however, there is a glimmer of hope here. Section 3.3.2 of Apple's developer agreement, which I have a feeling will be the source of a lot of controversy and discussion in the coming year, does say that you cannot submit over-the-air updates dynamically to iOS apps unless these updates are taking place through the JavaScript core engine. Now, JavaScript core is Apple's JavaScript engine that React Native uses to execute its code. So technically, per the terms of Apple's developer agreement, you can send an entire React Native app over the wire and automatically send updates to a user's phone without having to go through the App Store approval process. Now, just off this possibility alone, there's already like at least five startups working on this problem right now. Uh, App Hub is one example of them. Siphon is another, and, and there's plenty more. This is becoming like the new uh, split the check app that everyone makes at hackathons, which is just like update React Natives in production because this is such a huge problem that nobody's solved yet, and React Native gives us a possibility to do it. So while this is like somewhat controversial, I actually think Apple is going to let this play out, and you're going to be able to update React Native apps dynamically without having to go through the App Store, which is huge. 
the distribution, you know, you know, it's also a huge problem because you can't really test things out in the app store uh, the way you can on the web. Like if I want to give someone a free trial to my app for 48 days and then they have to pay for it, that's not really something you can natively implement. So it's really hard to charge for apps because someone will just look at it and be like, I don't want to pay $5 for this, where if you gave them a trial, maybe they would. So you have to resort to these in-app purchases and freemium models, which are more complex to implement and they're worse for the end users. Um, but React Native is going to give us a way, I think, to kind of get around this. We have these great communities on the web as well, uh, things like CodePen, where people can share HTML, CSS, and JavaScript snippets, and you can browse them and click on them and see the kind of code that they did and what the final results look like to get inspiration, to see implementations. And because mobile is such a closed off ecosystem, we don't really have these kind of communities. But React Native is helping bridge those barriers. Here's an example of something called React Native Playgrounds, where, which serves as kind of like a JS fiddle code pen tool for actual native mobile components. So like, if I wanted to see how Periscope does its heart fading animation, I could click on this, see somebody's actual implementation of it, get an emulator on my screen where I could look at it, or click run on your device and get a barcode that I could scan and actually run that natively on my phone. So we're starting to get this kind of really great community building around React Native apps. Mobile apps also have the, these wonky UI layout systems that, that both iOS and Android have visual editors that produce generated code. And like generated code is awful. Um, it's really hard to decipher, it's really hard to debug, and it's really hard to read in plain text. Even, even in these kind of like helpful visual forms, it's really hard to like quickly scan this and know what it's doing or know what to change. And you can compare this to the web where you just have CSS files, which are plain text. They're easy to read, they're easy to share, they're easy to decipher. I mean, the problem for a while was just that CSS was a bad model for doing layouts. But you know, like around 2013, when Flexbox started becoming really popular, uh, CSS started becoming amazing. I mean, like Flexbox is the greatest thing ever. Um, so React Native lets you use the CSS Flexbox layout system for styling instead of these visual editors to generate code, and that's awesome. There's also the problem of UI state management, and I'm not going to dive into this too much right now because I'm going to do a whole video on it later on. Um, but as the web has been increasingly moving towards single page applications where you load data dynamically onto the page and interact with user interfaces without needing to reload the page, it's become increasingly important to manage the state of a user interface at any given time. And React has emerged as the best solution that exists for doing this kind of state management. Um, and on mobile, you have the same problems where you have a screen and you can you know, navigate to a different screen or you can do high, highly interactive things within the context of a single screen. And if you do that, you need um, tooling to manage what the current state of that screen is. And you don't have great solutions for doing that now, but React is the best solution possible for it. So with React Native, you get React's entire UI state management um, tooling also. And like I said, I'll do a video on this later, but just know that it's really great in React Native. So what's been tried? If all these problems have been out here since the conception of mobile development, why hasn't it been solved yet? What have people been trying to do? Um, well, at a high level, um, Xcode will compile your Objective-C code into a native binary file that you use to run your code and deploy to the App Store. So, so one idea that's been around for a while is, why don't we just write compilers for other programming languages that can compile that language directly to that native binary file um, without the need for Objective-C or something? So an example of this would be RubyMotion, which compiles Ruby code directly into an executable binary. Um, another framework would be something like Xamarin, which uh, compiles C sharp code into native binary, um, or FireMonkey, uh, which does C++. But the, the problem with these frameworks are that they, they just feel really weird uh, to use um, because they're, they're not meant for something like Ruby. Like, um, you're still using the native iOS APIs. You're just writing them in Ruby instead of Objective-C, but you're not really changing the paradigm in which you're writing code to fit the Ruby style. So you get this really weird like asynchronicity, uh, asynchronicity rather, to, to, your, to your code. Also, they're closed source, um, which means like it's really hard to get bugs fixed, and there's like a lack of transparency uh, in the development process. Also, they're expensive. You have to pay to use them. Uh, which means that it's not great for community building. You're never going to get you know, these large communities around these paid products. Uh, so it's really hard to you know, find tutorials or, or be able to ask questions and get answers on like Stack Overflow, for example. So, so another idea that's been around for a while, if you think of, of running Safari on your phone, uh, you, can, you can load websites and you can run websites, uh, which means you must be able to run HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on your phone. I mean, clearly it works if you can open Safari and go to a website. So th there's been an idea that started with this project called PhoneGap that was, OK, well, can we just write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, embed it in a web view where we know it runs, and use that to kind of hack making a native iOS app? 
Um, so there's two really popular projects, one called Cordova, which I think evolved out of PhoneGap, and one called Ionic that does exactly that. They let you have this great workflow on the back end of writing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And then it will embed your code into these web views and then put them in, into a, an app so that it looks as if it's a native application. The, the only problem with this is that the non-native components are noticeably slower than the actual native components. So even a user um, that, that's just coming to your app for the first time is going to look at it and be like, there's something weird about this app. Like there's something off. Like things are not responding in the springiness and snappiness that I'd expect. So while the workflows are good, the actual end implementations aren't that great. So, so there's one other thing then that people have been trying which is um, using JavaScript core itself to render actually native components via an Objective-C bridge. So what, what that means is that there'll actually be a process running in a JavaScript thread. You'll write your code in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then you'll send it to that process, which will turn it into Objective-C code on the fly and spit out actual native components that feel and work like native components. So the example of this is something like uh, App Accelerator's Titanium. Uh, which is the best example of this, but it still had the same problems where it was, um, it cost money and was closed source and never had a great community. So React Native came along and, and it, it's the first framework now that uses this model of a, a, a native bridge in JavaScript core, um, but it's also free and open source with better UI workflows and has the support of Facebook open source behind it. So be, all these things kind of came together and like it's the first implementation that just really started to blow up where people are like, wow, you actually can write native, native, real native iOS apps in a better workflow with a great community around it. And now it's just kind of taking off. So React Native, a new hope. We now have a framework that can compile to both iOS and Android from the same code base. It can be written in JavaScript or any language that compiles to JavaScript. We have these great live reloading development workflows, and we can use any IDE we want to write code. We have instant over-the-air updates without the App Store approval process, better beta testing workflows, embeddable components on websites. We can use the Flexbox layout system, which is familiar and readable. We get the React model for managing UI state, and it really does make mobile application development more like web development in all the right ways. It's a really big deal. So if this intrigues you enough to want to continue on, then welcome to the fucking show. Let's code some React Native.